Welcome to this recording where we're going to be focusing on enhancing your audit and assurance question practice by effectively debriefing and self-marking your own answers. My name is Ben Wilson, I'm an expert ACCA tutor and I'm going to guide you through this presentation. We're going to look at three typical audit and assurance questions that come up regularly in the real exam. Firstly, audit risk questions. Next, control deficiencies. And thirdly, audit tests. So let's start with the audit risks. Now, in a typical audit risk question, the marking scheme will say that there's one mark per well-explained risk. But what makes a risk well-explained? It can be really hard to know when you're reviewing your own answers. So the kind of things you're looking for. Firstly, your risk needs to start with the scenario, starting with a fact from the scenario. Next, it's best to describe what kind of risk it is. Is it in an inherent risk, something that could go wrong because of the nature of the company's business? Is it a control risk, something that could go wrong because of a problem with the company's systems? They don't prevent or detect an issue from happening. Or is it a detection risk, something that's gone wrong with the auditor, so they've missed the problem? Next, it's really good if you can be precise about which account it is that's affected by this risk. For example, a problem with inventory. Also good if you can say what the direction of the problem is. Is it going to lead to an understatement or an overstatement? Sometimes you have to be precise about which direction it is to get the mark. And this is a bit more of a general one, but your explanation of the risk needs to be sufficiently detailed and precise. You can't leave any questions unanswered. Now let's have a look at an actual audit risk question and answer so you can see this in action. We're in the ACCA's practice platform software here using practice test two. So this is a test that you can access yourself and have a go at. Now I've already pre-populated some of the answers and we're now in the marking section of the practice platform. Now we're gonna be looking at question C here on screen. It's question 17 out of the test if you wanted to be navigating to it directly. What I'd like you to do is pause the recording and have a read of the scenario here that's showing and have a read of my audit risks and auditors responses and have a think about marking them for yourself. The marking scheme says that there's one mark per well-explained risk and one mark per auditor's response. So go through and mark this for yourself. Right, let's discuss these together now. We'll go through them each one in turn. The first risk that this is a new client. Great, that's come directly out of the scenario here. So that's a really good start. And it's been explained a bit. They've got a lack of knowledge of the business. They might miss issues. Now, what the answer here is describing is detection risk, but it hasn't used the phrase detection risk. So it runs the risk of not scoring a full mark. However, that is a decent explanation of the audit risk. So I am going to be, give them, be generous and I'm going to give that a full mark. The auditor's response, though, using a more experienced audit team, well, that's not quite enough. If you look in the scenario here, it tells us this is a listed company and they do, what trade are they in? Are they in consumer packaged goods? So it would have been better to improve this answer by saying we'd want to use an audit team that has experience of listed organisations. So they're more likely to know the rules and regulations for listed companies or they've got experience in this particular industry. So they're more likely to detect issues that are arising in the company's accounts. That, as it stands, is probably only worth half a mark. The next audit risk, that there's no year-end inventory count and lots of exceptions in the perpetual inventory count. Again, that's good. That starts with some information out of the scenario. I like that. The lack of evidence to support the year-end inventory balance, it could be misstated. Yeah, that's precise about which balance it is. And it goes on to say, well, it could be under or overstated. So again, I think I'm going to give that a full mark. However, the auditor's response here obtain alternative evidence to support year-end inventory is much too vague. There's not enough precise detail in here. We'd have to say what that evidence is. 
for example, getting the test results from these monthly perpetual inventory counts and doing tests of controls about how they're, they're performed. That would be a better test, but this is much too vague as it stands. So that's gonna score nothing. Our next risk that some sites weren't visited in the interim audit and that controls operating at the head office might not be in place or operating at the remote locations. There could be issues that we haven't picked up that could impact the year end numbers. Now this one is again good in that it's based on a fact out of the scenario. Look, it's here, isn't it? That these four additional sites uh, weren't visited. But the problem here is detection risk, isn't it? It's not just that the controls might not be operating, it's that they're not operating and we as the auditor aren't going to pick it up. And so I don't think there's enough detail there. It's not gone on to discuss that it's detection risk and therefore that's only going to be half a mark. And the auditor's response, make sure we visit all locations as part of the year end audit. I'd want a little bit more than that. We want to make sure we're visiting these, particularly these four additional sites. But it might be that these additional sites aren't particularly significant. So what I'd really want to be saying is I want to visit all of the material locations, but particularly these four that weren't visited. So again, I've left a little bit of detail out here, so I'm only going to give that half a mark. And the last risk I've picked out here, the legal action is outstanding and not yet decided. Having a provision or a contingent liability depends on how likely it is that the case is lost, making this a subjective area. Okay, well, this is based on a fact, isn't it? It's from this part of the scenario here. But I don't think I've done quite enough here in terms of saying whether it could be under or overstated. Management are quite possibly more likely to want to understate the provision to improve the profitability of the business. There could be some management bias. And that's the point I'd really want to get out here to make this worth a full mark. So I'm only gonna give this half a mark. It's subjective, but it's management's decision. So I'd want a little bit more here for a full mark. The auditor's response though is great. Discuss with legal counsel and get their opinion on how likely it is the case will be lost. I mean, that could be improved by saying, instead of discuss, it could be get some sort of documentary evidence, but still that's decent. And I like this, it's practical, isn't it? The second point, well, as long as possible before deciding, before signing the accounts. So there's more time for the case to be decided and less judgment involved. So I think this, this one's worth a full mark. You'll note that the question asks for seven audit risks and this student has only put four. So they've limited the number of marks available. How did your mark compare to mine? I gave them in total, what, one, two, three, for five marks in total here, wasn't it? What they did do was decent, but they just needed a bit more of it and a little bit more precision in some of their answers. On to our second type of question that comes up regularly in the AA exam, control deficiencies, where you have to go through a scenario and pick out some weaknesses in the company's systems and then suggest how you might improve them. Now, a marking scheme in a control deficiencies question it again tends to be a little bit vague. It says one mark per well-explained deficiency. And again, you'll be asking yourself, how do I know if my deficiency and my suggestion for how to improve it are well-explained? What am I looking for? Firstly, you must start with something out of the scenario. So the deficiency has to be based on a fact about the company but you need to develop that fact. What's going to go wrong as a result of this control deficiency? And you have to fully explain it. You've got to keep going, really hammer it down. So develop your point as to what could go wrong and keep going with the explanation. Very often in a control deficiency question, the student does a bit of an explanation, but doesn't develop it fully enough to score a full mark. We're going to have a look at an actual exam answer now so you can see how this is applied to an actual question. We're in the ACCA's practice platform again here and it's practice test two and we're looking at question 21 if you want to navigate straight to it. Identify and explain six deficiencies in this company's system and provide a recommendation to address each of these deficiencies. Same drill as before. 
what I'd like you to do is have a read through the scenario here and have a go at marking this answer. Each deficiency, if it's well explained, gets a mark, up to a mark. And each recommendation, if it's a detailed recommendation and it's appropriate, then that scores up to one mark. Pause the recording and have a go. Right, let's go through this together now. The first deficiency, only the 20 biggest stores have been visited by the Internal Audit Department. That's based on a fact, isn't it, from here? However, just stating a fact from the scenario is not enough. You need to explain why it's a deficiency. So why is that a problem that only the biggest stores have been visited? Well, it could be that the problems are in the other stores, the ones that haven't been visited. So there could be significant control issues in the other, what, 25 stores, and that wouldn't have been detected by internal audit. So at the minute, that doesn't score any credit at all. What about the recommendation? Make sure that all stores are visited every year by internal audit and they test all of the controls to make sure the numbers are right. Now, my problem with this is it's a bit unrealistic. The internal audit department would have to be very well resourced to be able to visit all 45 stores and test every single control. So it's a bit unrealistic. It might score a full mark if the mark is feeling generous or more likely if like me, they're thinking, oh, this person is being a bit unrealistic with their suggestion, they'll only give it half a mark. So nothing for that control deficiency, half a mark for the recommendation, I think. What about the second deficiency? All store employees are able to use each till and none have an individual logon code when using the tills. And that again is based on the scenario. So that first sentence is really just lifted out of the scenario, but then it is developed, it is explained a bit further. This means that there isn't a record who's, of who has been on each till. Now that's good, that's almost there, but they, they've done that thing that students often do and they don't fully explain their point. Why is it a problem if there isn't a record? Well, if somebody is perpetrating a fraud, they're doing something dodgy on one of those tills, then we wouldn't be able to trace who it is. In fact, if you know that you can go onto your mate's till and steal some money out of it and nobody is going to have a record that you've been on there, it's encouraging you to commit fraud almost, isn't it? So this needs further development. It's, it is allowing fraud to take place. So the control deficiency, I think only half a mark. It's reasonable, but it's not fully explained. The recommendation, putting digital swipe cards in place, which automatically log out after five minutes. Whoa, that's great. It's a practical suggestion and it's fleshed out with real detail. Now I can only give one mark, but if I was able to give more than one mark, I would give it because that's a really good recommendation with great detail added. What about the third deficiency? Don't worry about the typo. You can clearly tell that it's reconciliations, can't you? And you don't get marked down for that kind of thing. Reconciliations are done in total for all tills to save time. Yes, that's based on a fact, isn't it? Out of the scenario down here. This means there won't be a trail of where any problems happened, making it harder to identify problems and fix them. Lovely. This one starts with a fact, goes on to explain it, and what the, that's a problem. Excellent. There's a full mark there. That's a fully explained point. What about the recommendation? Doing a separate reconciliation for each till. I mean, it's short, but it's sweet, isn't it? That is exactly what we need to do, a separate reconciliation for each till. Could I have added a bit more detail onto it? Well, saying who would do the test, perhaps the store's assistant manager, but I'm being a bit harsh. That's a really good control and therefore, and it does work. And so I'm going to give it a full mark. How did your mark compare to mine? I gave what, half, one and a half, two, three, four here. Four out of 12. Seems like I've been a bit harsh, but look, the question asks for six deficiencies and this student has only picked out three. Yet again, by not writing enough points, they're limiting the mark available. On now to our third and final type of question that commonly comes up in the AA exam, generating audit tests. 
And again, the marking scheme will say one mark per well-explained test. What kind of thing do you need to do to make it well-explained though? Firstly, be precise, particularly with the verb that you use. Say things like inquire, observe, or agree. Don't use general words like test or check, because those are often things that don't score marks. You need to be more precise. Best if you can quote a source of evidence that you're using. Agree something to the bank statement or title deeds, for example. And great if you can bring in a financial statement assertion, something like completeness, existence, rights and obligations, valuation. That really helps. OK, let's look at an actual exam question then to see how audit tests come up and see how they're marked. We're back here with our old friend practice test two from the ACCA's practice platform. We've moved on to question 22 now, where we're asked to describe substantive procedures that the auditor should perform to obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence in relation to the matter identified regarding insects for UCO. And here's the information down here. It's about completeness of income. Okay, same drill as before. I'd like you to pause the recording and mark my answer. One mark per well-explained substantive procedure. Let's go through each of these in turn then. The first one, a detailed analytical procedure over income. Oh, I like the phraseology already. This person sounds like they know what they're talking about. And they've talked about exactly how you would do it. Set an expectation of each income type using last year's income. Compare to actual and investigate differences. Now, I like this one. It would help with completeness because if one of the income types has fallen, that suggests that something is perhaps incomplete. Now, it would have been better to say if there were any falls compared to prior year, it could suggest incomplete income, as in refer to the account balance, but it's still, it's well explained. So I'm gonna give that a full mark. The second one, and this is the one that I really like, the charity event tickets. So looking at one, type of income particularly, these three events that they hold annually. Getting the ticket stubs or some kind of record to look some, some documentation, great, of the number of people attending the event, multiplying by the sales price per ticket and comparing to the income recorded from sales. That's a really decent test because if that calculation comes up with a higher number than the amount of income that was recorded for that event, it suggests that something dodgy has gone on. Now, it would be better if it went on and said that, that if it was, if this number is, 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 is higher than the amount of income that has been recorded from the event, it would suggest incomplete revenue. But I still think it's well explained enough to get a full mark. What about the third one? Look at the pattern of monthly donations. There could be similar seasonality year on year. If there's a reduction in a certain month, it could be that income isn't recorded in that month. Now, my problem with this one is it's rather similar to the first one, isn't it? It's basically an analytical procedure and it's a bit too repetitive, a bit too similar. So I'm not going to give that a mark. Learning point for you there. You've got to try to make different points. And this fourth one here, discuss with management what has gone on at the charity in the year and see if that fits with, with the numbers. That's a bit of a weak test. I'm not going to give that a mark. The reason being that it's not using anything out of the scenario. It'd be way better to talk about something particular about these monthly donations paid by bank transfer. For example, agreeing to the bank records or the postal records around these donations that are sent in. There were specific things in the scenario that you needed to use to generate your answer rather than making generic points like this fourth one. So the third one didn't score because it was repetition. The fourth one didn't score because it was generic. And a great learning point for you there when you're designing audit tests in the exam, don't rote learn them and stick them down. You have to run with the scenario and respond to the specifics. So I gave that two marks only, two out of four. We've reached the end of this session now. Thanks for watching and I hope you've picked up some useful tips that will help you when marking and reviewing your own work.